Whether you realize it or not, 1998 probably changed your life. If you're American, it's the year that you got the Pokemon anime. And if you're Japanese, it's the year that you got everything else. Toei Animation released a pretty popular show about cards. Madhouse released a pretty popular show about cards, but now it's a girl. Triangle Staff released a show about a girl, but theirs was about computers and other stuff. And then, of course, there was that show with the cool spiky-haired gunslinger in a sci-fi setting who struggles with the intersection of violence and morality while running from and confronting the violence of his past and the memories of a woman he loved and lost because of a man he grew up with. Okay, there were two of those. Of all these stories, the Trigun manga is the oldest, first published in 1995. It probably predates most of the anime you've ever seen. For example, it came out a year before the Pokemon franchise, including the games. And now suddenly everyone is talking about it again. I'm assuming you've seen the trailer for the upcoming 2023 maybe reboot by Studio Orange called Trigun Stampede, which I'm not going to comment on because we haven't seen the show yet, and it would be irresponsible to make a blanket opinion based solely on some out-of-context animation and voice lines. Instead, I wanted to make a video for anyone who's confused or nostalgic or otherwise tri-curious about what this whole Trigun thing is. I figure I've got about a year before this video loses all relevance, so we should probably get started. Hello, I'm Hawkwood, and Trigun was my first anime. I may be a little biased. The manga describes Trigun as deep space planet future gun action, and that's not wrong. The anime is 26 episodes long, finished way before the manga did, so it deviates a bit in the end, but it does tell a full story and resolve all its plot threads, which is always nice to see. In my opinion, anecdotally, based solely on my own experiences, it feels like Trigun exists in this odd state within the anime community. It's been insanely influential on the media that came after it, and it was extremely popular in America when it was first released, with that popularity eventually backfilling back to Japan years later. But it seems like no one ever talks about it. You can't start an internet anime conversation without Cowboy Bebop slipping its jazz riffs in there someplace, despite the fact that both shows came out at the same year and share a lot of similarities. But for some reason, Trigun's legacy seems to be relegated to the status of What should I watch after Full Metal Alchemist? Trigun is a classic, but it's not really treated like one. As for why that is, I don't have a fucking clue. Maybe because the animation hasn't aged as well, or because the western genre fell out of vogue, I don't know. But I can at least focus on what Trigun was and what it had to say. There will be spoilers, but I'll be doing them in episode order, and with big spoiler warnings, so you can stop watching the video whenever I convince you to watch the show. And then come back and tell me about it. That'd be cool. As I mentioned, Trigun was sort of my first anime. I had watched some episodes of Dragon Ball Z and Yu-Gi-Oh! by the time I got introduced to Trigun, but it was the first one with a mature, well-planned, cohesive story with rich character development and all that good shit. If I was a snob, like I used to be, I would say it was my first real anime. I try not to be like that anymore. I rewatched the series recently and I wasn't sure what to expect. Nostalgia is a hell of a drug, and I was afraid I wouldn't be able to ever know whether Trigun was objectively good or whether I was just getting off on that memory high. But luckily, after only a couple of episodes, I could finally see what gripped me so quickly all those years ago. And it wasn't what I thought. It wasn't just that it was cool or edgy, and it wasn't just that it was new. It was because Trigun's not just a genre story. It's a mystery box. Fans of reading about people being mad about stuff online will recognize the term mystery box as a catch-all term for why kids these days can't make a good TV show, supposedly. The blame for the term gets set solely on the talented but lens-flared shoulders of J.J. Abrams because of a pretty entertaining TED Talk of his and his TV show Lost. Lost is all about mysteries. If you've never seen Lost, 
then you know as many of the answers as anyone who has. But for the less critical, the term mystery box has become a kind of genre onto itself, describing any show that focuses more on presenting questions than presenting answers. The best ones, like the show Dark on Netflix, eventually give satisfying answers as well. So really, it's like watching a hundred mysteries at once. Personally, I love it when a new question shifts my perspective of the entire narrative, so that I realize I don't have a goddamn clue what the show was actually about. Lost came out in 2004. Trigun came out in 1998. We're about to get into spoilers now. We'll start with episodes 1 through 6. Literally the first line of the first episode of Trigun is a question. It's a mystery which won't be answered for certain until episode 5, and also stands as the core thematic consideration of the entire series. Vash the Stampede? Who is Vash the Stampede? What we know from the beginning is that he's a man, potentially tall with a mohawk, potentially wearing a red coat and wielding a large gun. The entire first episode plays on this uncertainty, where the man's legend far outshines the man himself. Meryl is our audience surrogate, and we can't help but share her disbelief. The OP of the show promised us a man of deep contemplation, a demon who wields a single gun like a trained samurai, a force of nature who wanders an alien hellscape alone. Huh? When did you get here? Thanks a lot, I was really getting hungry! This can't be the guy. Normally, a show would reveal Vash the Stampede at the end of the first episode. It's a tried and true method of storytelling. It's satisfying. It's clean. But remember, this isn't just a TV show. It's a mystery box. The answer has to be earned, typical narrative conventions be damned. The show offers us little hints through the first episode's somewhat subtle indications that maybe Vash is more than who he seems, but those hints get muddled in the silliness of his character. Is this a man with skill or a cartoon character with luck? How would we even know? Our same questions are asked by our dear audience surrogate, and we learn the answer in the same moment she does, when we see him standing his ground for the first time. He is a man of skill and confidence, a man whose morality outweighs his fear, a humanoid typhoon, Vash the Stampede, who can stop a rampaging, gun-fisted, giant baby man-thing using only six bullets. Holy shit. Trigun the anime tends to be episodic, with each episode presenting a complex moral clusterfuck for Vash to mediate. Sprinkled then are hints of a larger narrative offered more as questions for our mystery box format. Within the first six episodes of Trigun, it teases the audience with the following questions. What is a plant? Where does lost technology come from? Just where the hell are we? For that matter, when are we? Who is Vash looking for, and why does our pacifist hero seem to want to kill him? What happened to the lost city of July? How has Vash not aged in 30 years? And why the hell is the show called Trigun if the main character only has one gun? If you're interested in watching Trigun, I recommend you stop the video here and go check it out on Crunchyroll. I can promise you with certainty, every one of these mysteries has an answer, and they're all satisfying. There aren't many shows you could say that about. Please like this video on your way out and then come back when you're done. We got a lot more to talk about. For the rest of you, it's on to the next set of spoilers, episode 7 through 11. Episodes 7 and 8 are probably the most Trigun of the whole series. We have Steam Power, Lost Tech, a tragic character backstory, Vash barely surviving unbeatable odds, two villain redemption arcs inspired by Vash's philosophy, and of course, one hell of a gimmicky villain. His name is Brilliant Dynamites Neon, yes with a plural dynamites, and yes he's wearing dynamos on his shoulder. Welcome to Trigun. There's a really cool moment when we get to see Vash's terror when he accidentally shoots someone a little too hard. It's the first time we see him mess up, and his look of fear and panic shows us that this whole don't kill anyone-ness is not just an act. It's the show's way of making sure we understand, as the little steam street urchin says, 
The Vash has purposefully avoided killing them this entire time. That's the level of incomprehensible skill the Vash possesses. It's sort of terrifying. While the episode is crazy enough, the final moments kick us in the heart with another one of those good mysteries, introducing the concept of Vash's past for the first time. Then for kicks, it ties it all together with a song that someone from his past used to love. It's beautiful, and by the end of the episodes, your emotions are all mixed up so you feel a bit like Vash yourself. Overwhelmed, wistful, and somehow a bit optimistic. Nothing quite explains what the hell is Trigun quite like those two episodes. Except that Trigun isn't just about Vash. There's the whole supporting cast to consider, and no one is as supportive as everyone's favorite cast member, Nicholas D. Wolfwood. Boy, does he have a character arc, and we're not talking about that right now. That is one heck of a well-prepared dead guy. Wolfwood is a fascinating character right from the beginning because the only thing we know about him for a fact is that he's a liar. Hey, I have to tell you, I've never fired a gun before. His skills at marksmanship are far above NPC level, which isn't something we've seen in the show aside from Vash himself. How come you're good? Wolfwood doesn't love killing, but he's not afraid to do it when necessary. This puts him at odds with Vash for the rest of the show, as each stubborn personality tries to change the other. He's not a voice of morality, but he is a voice of practicality. If you've ever wanted to yell at the screen that Vash is being naive, don't worry. Wolfwood's doing it for you. And that is absolutely everything you need to know about Trigun because episode 12 changes all of it. At this moment, maybe you're thinking Trigun isn't shonen enough. Maybe you're thinking Trigun isn't dark enough. Well, don't worry, friend. You won't be thinking that anymore. Spoilers for the rest of the show. This man is Legato Blue Summers, and he is the most evil and terrifying thing probably ever. There seems to be no limit to his power, and he is a sociopath. He cannot be reasoned with, he cannot be fought against, and he cannot be ignored. He is a force of nature with a mission, and that mission is to make Vash the Stampede suffer. It is the only thing he wants, and he spends the rest of the show getting it. This is a villain who wins. To this end, he summons 12-ish human assassins with an array of more-than-human abilities named the Gung-Ho Guns, all of which have especially edgelord names and titles like Monav the Gale, Grey the Nine Lives, and Zazi the Beast. Legato sets them against Vash one-ish at a time. It goes poorly for everyone involved, especially Vash, whose mentality and morality is tested again and again in more fucked-up ways. Their designs and powers are pretty cool sometimes, and they're fun to watch, except when they aren't. But hey, you ask, what about all those mysteries? Oh, Trigun didn't forget. Trigun was just waiting until after Vash blows a hole in the moon. Oh, right, um, Vash blows a hole in the moon, because his gun is also an arm that transforms into an angel, and... You know what, don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. Because now episode 17 is happening. It's a bit of a flashback, roughly in the neighborhood of 131 years, and it's fucking wild. For starters, it's on a spaceship. For seconds, Vash is a kid. And, hey, who's that? Oh, that's gonna complicate the narrative. This is what I love about a good mystery box. There are 26 episodes in Trigun. We've got 17 of them before we actually learn what the fuck is even going on. Everything is suddenly different now that we have context. So now that we're here, just what the hell is Trigun? Trigun is a story about humanity. Trigun is a story about two brothers. Importantly, these two brothers are not a part of humanity. They are something else. Time affects them differently, and their IQ is unchartable. In this episode, they are one year old. Trigun is a story about children. In this story, 
These children who are not human learns what it means to be human. These children born on a spaceship learns what it means to have a home. Vashin knives are learning. Vashin knives are thinking. Vash is the serious one. He's grown attached to Rem, a woman who has become their caretaker. Vash forgives the man who treats them badly just for being different. Knives does not. Trigun is a story about philosophy. When they find a butterfly struggling in a spider web, Vash instinctively reaches to save the butterfly. Knives instinctively kills the spider. This is what Trigun is about. A simple disagreement and a simple fact. If you free the butterfly, the spider starves. You can't save them both. Vash does not like this fact. He sort of bases his whole personality around not liking it, and the show never solves this supposed riddle for us. It's the same problem that complicates every story about pacifism. To get editorial for a moment, pacifist stories annoy me. I love Batman, but if he would have just killed the Joker years ago, he could have prevented millions of people from dying. We all know this. This is a fact. The Joker is beyond redemption. That blood is on Batman's hands because he made a choice to save one villainous life over the multitude of innocent ones. His one rule does not hold up under scrutiny. If the Joker is alive, people die. The end. So what does Trigun say about pacifism? And more importantly, since it's my video, what do I think about what Trigun says about pacifism? Well, what it says is something interesting. It doesn't solve the spider v. butterfly riddle, but it does do something that other pacifist stories don't. It shows the cost. Vash the Stampede is not human. He is very old, and he has never lived a single day for himself. Ever since he was one year old, he has been tasked with a sacred mission that only he can achieve. Keep people alive. This planet is not meant for humans. It's a hellscape of famine and drought. The little electricity they do have comes from dying spaceship technology. The humans here are young and aimless, and even the oldest city has existed for barely a hundred years. They are humanity at their worst, their most hungry, their most scared, and their most desperate. Vash doesn't just want to save the innocent ones, he wants to save them all. All of them are precious, both the butterflies and the spiders. It's naive, and he knows it's naive, but it's all he can do. He has to try, because it's what she would have wanted. While Batman gets to parade around play boyically without so much as a scar from shaving, Vash is more scar than body. In one of the earlier episodes, Vash pretends to be asleep when he's propositioned by some professionals. This seems out of character for such an overtly womanizing guy until several episodes later, when he says one line that feels like a joke. It's not exactly something I like girls to see. He's ashamed of his body, and that's just another thing that keeps him distant from everyone else. Interestingly, given his lineage, his scars would actually heal if only he'd stop expending so much energy trying to save everyone. They are miseries he could reverse just by wavering in his ideology for a while. I can talk all I want about how naive his pacifism is, but I can't deny his commitment. So in the end, I don't mind the pacifism, because it's shown as a struggle, not just a choice. It comes at a cost, and he doesn't always succeed. He isn't pretending that he can, he's just trying his best even if he has to feed the spiders himself. For the last nine episodes, the show plays with these themes, introducing some more backstory to fill in some more gaps, and ties together all the loose plot threads and character arcs. And while Vash deals with the last of Legato's assassins, and Legato himself, and of course, his own brother, Knives. It's a good show. So how's the manga? So the manga is complicated. It comes in two flavors. Two large books called Trigun that start at number one, and another set of books called Trigun Maximum that also starts at number one. This is not a reprint, 
And this is not a sequel, this is just the second part to the same story. Manga are originally released as chapters in anthology magazines like the insanely popular Shonen Jump. Trigun got its start releasing chapters in a magazine called Monthly Shonen Captain, which closed publication before the series ended. In order to publish them in another magazine, the title had to be changed, hence Trigun Maximum. Those chapters are collected in the little books, so read the big books, and then read the small books. That'll be the whole story. Okay. While the Trigun anime is a mystery box, the Trigun manga is not. It tells us on the first page that Vash is a pacifist. Chapter 2 opens with a summary of how humans came to this planet from colony ships, and that Vash destroyed the city of July. The Wolfwood twist happens in the same chapter he gets introduced. When they made the show, they moved around a lot of the stories, split parts into different scenarios, and slowed things down a bit. They also stretched out the original pilot chapter into an episode, which is pretty cool. Other than that, the anime is a faithful adaptation, to a point, but the anime is just honestly... better. The manga is chaotic and hard to follow sometimes, even if the art is pretty cool, but if you've seen the show, then you won't find a lot here that you haven't already witnessed. That is, until Knives shows up, in Volume 2, to crumple Legato into a ball with his bare hand. So yeah, while the show had to spend a lot of time figuring out how to end the story, the manga was still trying to figure out where it should even go. Because of that, it doesn't withhold information the way the show does, and it just goes crazy as fuck sometimes. That same scene where Knives reappears ends when he tries to get Vash to kill all the other gung-ho guns at once with the angel arm just for kicks, and also Knives is naked because he was just born. Again. Overall, I'd recommend the show over the manga. It's a fantastic adaptation and makes the story better than the original. But if the show turns out to be like your favorite thing ever, then... Yeah, definitely check out the manga, too. There's just more there, including at least one bonus, Gung-Ho Gun. And that's about it for Trigun. There was a video game that got announced in 2002 and never came out, which is a shame because the gimmicky villains could be fun as hell to fight against. Maybe if the 2023 show does good, then it'll revitalize the franchise. That'd be nice. And as always, thanks for watching. I hope I've managed to introduce you to something you didn't know before, or at least reminded you of something that you had forgotten. That's the whole point of this channel, so leave a comment if it worked, and try not to be a snob about anime like I used to. Nobody likes that guy.